How should we look at Notre Dame? In at least three different ways, actually. You can observe it from above, which highlights the layout. You can take an elevation perspective to focus on the huge interior volumes. Last but not least, you can look at and admire its facades. Let's take a closer look at the cathedral from these three perspectives, each remarkable in its own way. Let's look at the cathedral layout, as it was defined when construction began in 1163. The overall impression is very harmonious. Everything is well proportioned, with nothing unsightly or out of place. The chosen design was for a very large church arranged in five adjoining volumes called aisles. As we will see, it had all the characteristic features of a traditional Gothic cathedral. For example, this space is the choir. This is where the clergy would sit during ceremonies. The rounded part, known as the apse, accommodates the altar. Running around the choir is a double ambulatory, that is to say, two galleries serving chapels devoted to various saints. The eastern part of the cathedral is called the chevet. The chevet resembles a rotunda when viewed from the exterior. This was intended as an evocation of the Holy Sepulchre or the Temple of Jerusalem, often represented as a circular building. To the west of the choir, here is the transept. This transverse aisle gives the cathedral the shape of a cross. It also offers direct access to the residence of the canons, to the north and to the episcopal palace to the south. Further west is the nave with its double side aisles. This is the area open to the general congregation. It is used for ceremonial entrances by clergy members and dignitaries. We can see that it is not very much longer than the choir, and can deduce that the cathedral was primarily designed by the clerics as an instrument for the liturgy. Like the ambulatory, the nave is lined with chapels, which were added in the 13th and 14th centuries. We have seen the plan view. Now let's enter the cathedral on the ground floor through the great doors to the west. One is immediately struck by the sheer scale of the volume and elevations, and by the exceptionally large number of columns. The vaults reach a height of 33 meters, roughly equivalent to a 10-story building. In this image, we can see that the elevation levels are different. Above the large arcades, there is a tribune floor. Above these tribunes, some significant changes have been made over the years. In the 12th century, a floor with rose windows was created above them, as you can see on the right, and higher up, a further tier of clear story windows. In the 13th century, the clear story windows were enlarged and the rose windows removed. Constantly building and embellishing the cathedral consumed countless tons of stone, wood, glass, lead, and so on. How did the structure not collapse under its own weight? Back in 1163, no one had ever built a Gothic cathedral with five aisles and 33-meter-high vaults. To better understand the building's strength, let's look at this cross-section of the nave. We can clearly see how Notre Dame's structure resembles a pyramid, with the outer side aisles supporting the inner side aisles. Similarly, the tribunes above the side aisles support the nave. To strengthen the whole, flying buttresses were were built at several levels from the outset. Their role is to transfer loads outward. The vaults are based on a square design and are reinforced by a double transverse arch. As a result, these vaults have six constituent elements. They are very slender, barely 10 to 15 centimeters thick to reduce their weight. Let's exit the cathedral now to marvel at its facades. There are three facades, the largest of which faces west. Its décor is particularly rich, as it was through this facade that the congregation and ceremonial processions entered. This is naturally where the forecourt or parvis is located. The western facade boasts two towers and has three portals on its lower level. These three portals are decorated with dozens of sculpted figures. We'll come back to those later. A gallery extending over the portals accommodates statues of kings, of which there are 28 today. The harmonious rose window is a prodigious achievement. 
measuring 9.6 meters in diameter, it majestically crowns the statue of the Virgin Mary flanked by two angels. This is only fitting, as the building is entirely dedicated to her. Let's turn our attention to the two towers. If you look closely, you can see that they are not symmetrical. The north tower is broader than its southern counterpart. A high gallery extends between the two towers, giving a convincing impression of lightness. The towers were originally intended to be topped with spires, but these were never built. As it stands today, the Notre Dame's west façade is a masterpiece of quite remarkable proportions. Now let's look at the north and south façades of the transept. The façades we see today were created in the middle of the 13th century. These intricate stone and glass laceworks, typical of the rayonnant Gothic style, are embellished with a gallery and a large rose window. Turning to the south façade, which also dates from the 13th century, we know that its architect was Jean de Chelle. We know this because he received the honor of having his name engraved in a commemorative inscription, something quite unique in the Middle Ages. Together, we have explored the layout and structure of the Paris Cathedral, which at the time of its construction was the largest and tallest in the world. As you have seen, it is not only huge, but also solidly built. Its grace and delicate appearance are conducive to contemplation and spiritual elevation. It should come as no surprise to learn that it is visited and admired by 12 million people every year.